Welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is part of our Teaching NGSS in Elementary School series, and it is titled Teaching NGSS in Elementary Schools, Third Grade. Our presenters are Ted Willard, Carla Zumble Saul, Mary Starr, Kathy Renfrew, and a special guest, Kimber Hirschberger. My name is Sue Hokanen, and I will be moderating today's program. Jeff Lehman is also online with us tonight to provide technical support. I want to remind you to visit the NSTA Learning Center, your online portal for professional learning and over 11,900 resources for science educators. And I'm actually going to go ahead and post a link in the chat window for you right now, but I don't want you to go there yet. I just want you to bookmark it for later. I want you to stay here where you're going to miss a really awesome web seminar. Um, I want to remind you that you will find over 4,200 of these resources are free, and you can add them to your library to access when it's convenient for you. You can organize your resources by bundling them into collections or access thousands of other collections made by NSTA and other teachers. I'm going to encourage you to join the conversations in the community forums where you can discuss content and classroom issues with other teachers, and our online advisors are available to help you Find the information you are looking for. And you can use the free tools within the Learning Center to help organize your own professional development to help meet your professional development and learning goals. And it's all available at learningcenter.nsga.org. And with that, I'd like to t introduce today's presenters. Ted Willard is the director of NGSS at NSTA. Carla Zumble Saul is a professor of science education at Penn State University. Mary Starr, Executive Director of Michigan Mathematics and Science Centers Network, and Kathy Renfrew, K-5 Science Coordinator with Vermont Agency of Education and an NGSS cur Curator. Welcome, everyone. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ted. Welcome, Ted. Thanks very much, Sue, for that great introduction and uh, getting us all organized here as General Master of Ceremonies. <coughs> I want to just take, take a moment here and give you just a quick rundown of some general information about the standards. And so we're all on the same page around this. I'm sure some of you have seen me discuss this before, but the, I think some people will learn some things new. NGSS, as it is, um, was developed by a group of four organizations working together. There's the National Academies of Science, ACHIEVE, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and surprise, surprise, my favorite, <coughs> NSTA. And the standards were developed as part of a two-part process. There was first the framework for K-12 science education that was developed and released in 2011. And then the standards themselves that were released in 2013. And the standards are designed to help out with curricula, instruction, assessment, pre-service education, and professional learning. We're going to take a look at the framework first as, a, as an initial piece. Um, if you haven't read the framework or don't have a copy of the framework, there's no real excuse. You can get a free, a free PDF from National Academies Press, or you can also go and get a hard copy from NSTA at the NSTA store. And the key point in the framework is this idea of three dimensions in science, and so we're working on three-dimensional learning. There's the science and engineering practices, the cross-cutting concepts, and the disciplinary core ideas as they make up those three di dimensions. We'll kind of talk about each of those. <coughs> the practices are the things that scientists do to figure out the world around them and that students want to do to learn in the classroom. And so asking qu scientific questions or developing models, planning and carrying out investigations, constructing explanations, designing solutions, engaging in argument, all of these are different practices that students would be using. The cross-cutting concepts, on the other hand, are things that are not unique to any one subject area, but really cut across, get it, cross-cutting, all of the different science disciplines. So patterns, scale, systems, these type of ideas are cross-cutting concepts. And then we have disciplinary core ideas organized in life, science, physical science, earth and space science, and engineering, which that might be new for some people to see. 
And each of these disciplines gets broken down into further details. And even further than that, you can go and break everything down. <coughs> so all of that structure was designed in the framework. And you can see the different pieces that are come together in the framework. And that fed into what the standards look like. <coughs> and so the standards themselves were developed by a group of 26 states, all the ones in blue there. And each state had a team that was involved in providing feedback. There are also 41 separate writers spread across the country, as you can see on this map here. And about half of those writers were actually classroom teachers at the time they got involved in the program. Big news on the adoption front. Um, we had, until a week ago, 12 states plus the District of Columbia that had adopted. But West Virginia joined us just last Thursday. And so congratulations to West Virginia for joining. And as I like to say now, you can drive all the way from Chicago to Newark, New Jersey, just taking in NGSS states. Not the, <coughs> not the easiest directory, but we're working there. We're going to slowly get across the whole country. And then we're going to do a major road trip. That makes us have basically 30% of students, 3 in 10 students, live in a state that has adopted NGSS. So now let's take a look at a performance expectation, get a little bit of a sense of what it looks like. So here's one from third grade. Representing data in tables and graphical displays, I'm sorry, represent data in tables and graphical displays to describe typical weather conditions expected during a particular season. Now a performance expectation it's a combination of the practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts into a single statement describing what is to be assessed. It's not meant to say, this is what you as a teacher do in your classroom. It's not an instructional strategy or not an individual lesson objective. It's bigger and broader than that. It's what happens at the end of instruction, what your students should be ready to do. That said, that performance expectation does capture all of the different dimensions. So represent data in tables and graphical displays to describe something. That pulls directly from this practice. <coughs> the idea of, oh, I don't know what I just did there. There we go. Here we go. The idea about typical weather conditions expected during a particular season fits along with this core idea of weather across different times and areas. That scientists record patterns of the weather across different times and areas so they can make predictions about what the weather might happen next. <coughs> and then we have patterns of change can be used to make predictions. And we've got here this idea of expected during a particular season, this idea of predictions about particular seasons. And so this single performance expectation provides a way to assess all three dimensions simultaneously. And so with that little quick introduction to the performance expectations, we'll pass things off to the three musketeers. Thank you, Ted. Um, this is Carla, and we'd like to welcome everyone tonight to Teaching NGSS in Elementary School with a focus on third grade. Inheritance and variation of traits um, will, be the, um, will be the piece that we really target tonight. And I have to say, with um, 117 people in the room this close to uh, a holiday break, we are completely impressed with your dedication and commitment to the profession. So thank you again for joining us tonight. My name is Carla Zembelfall. I'm a professor of science education at Penn State University and co-author of the book, What's Your Evidence? Engaging K-5 Students in Constructing Explanations in Science. Mary? All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Mary Starr, and I'm the executive director of the Michigan Mathematics and Science Centers Network. I'm also lucky enough to be the um, co-author of Project Based and Career Science, uh, which is a middle school set of science materials. And I'm going to put a little plug in for Twitter, because I'd love to have some more followers and people to talk with. So if you use Twitter, please feel free to follow me at Star Science. All right, Kathy, your turn. Thanks, Mary. Um, I want to ditto Mary's um, Twitter request before I forget. But I'm Kathy Renfrew, 
and I work for the Vermont Agency of Education, former classroom teacher, um, and I currently am the K-5 science coordinator, and I'm an NGSS curator and an NSTA online advisor, and we are so happy to welcome you tonight. Thanks, Kathy and Mary. I think if you were here early enough, you might have heard Sue introduce our special guest, but we are very fortunate tonight to have um, Kimber Hirschberger with us, the co-author from What's Your Evidence? So, Kimber, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm excited to be here. I'm a third grade teacher, and this is about third grade teaching, so it's great to be here. I teach in State College, Pennsylvania, and I always have a class of students who are eager scientists and I hope to share some of that with you tonight. Great. Thanks, Kimber. So a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight, um, an overview for the session. Um, we'll be looking at the NGSS topics for third grade and unpacking in particular um, the Life Science 3-1 on inheritance and variation of traits with uh, the scientific practices of analyzing and interpreting data. As always, we're going to have a video of, of classroom practice, and tonight that's going to be of Kimber in her classroom at the beginning of the year. And then Kathy always loops back around and provides um, amazing resources that are targeted to support um, the particular performance expectation that we're looking at in any given session. So in the past few um, of these webinars in the Teaching NGSS and Elementary School series, we've asked people to tell us a little bit about their experience with NGSS. And to be quite honest, it's consistently all over the map. Some people who are brand new to it, some people who are exploring and learning about it, and others who are proficient and um, teaching NGSS in their classrooms. So we decided to do something a little bit different tonight, which is to find out who's out there, how many actual third grade teachers or other teachers. So Sue, can you remind everybody of how to use their, it looks like they're doing a great job, but how to use their um, clip art. Certainly. Um, it, the whiteboard tools are there. All you need to do is go to the very bottom of the whiteboard tool where you see what looks like a mountain with the sun coming out over the top of it. Open up that box, select a piece of clip art, and place it in the appropriate column to answer this question. And you guys are doing a great job. Just let me know when you want me to pause them, and I will pause the tools. <laughs> Great, and thanks to those people who are completing, um, who are marking the other column and letting us know in the chat window um, what it is that they're, what that other means. We know there are a wide range there. So this is great. It's so it's great to see so many third grade teachers and classroom teachers with us tonight. But welcome to everybody, and we're glad that you're that you're here with us. Give it another second, and then Sue, you can turn off the clip art tool, tools. So a little bit about web seminar interactions. Um, this is a standard slide that we use to um, encourage you to be an engaged participant tonight. Um, but to really tell you the truth, I've been incredibly impressed by the learning community that's developed within each seminar. Um, it's absolutely excellent when participants can share their ideas and questions and resources in the chat window throughout the entire throughout the entire process. So I know that others have appreciated that as well. So if there's a link that's directly relevant or a comment or question and it's not quite time to ask those questions yet or do a poll, the chat window is a great place to participate and communicate with us. And with that, we're going to turn it over to Mary Starr and she'll get us started with the topics for third grade. Awesome. Thanks, Carla. So usually we start out the webinars with a little bit of an overview of the particular grade level. So um, that's where we're going to start today. And then as we go through the webinar, we'll, we'll dive down more deeply into specific uh, performance expectations. So there are actually four uh, topics for the third grade for NGSS. And each one of them provides a great opportunity to engage students in investigations, in science talk, and really diving into scientific phenomena. So besides the life science inheritance and, and variation of traits, there's also independent, interdependent relationships in ecosystems. Um, then in Earth and space systems, the topic for third grade is weather and climate. And then finally, um, for physical science, it's forces and interactions. So today, you'll notice that we have highlighted 
the uh, specific topic, which is going to be inheritance and variation of traits um, for third grade. So when you look at these um, core ideas, uh, hang on a minute. There we go. Sorry. Um, we're, with our focus topic, um, you're going to find that you can um, really look for additional information in a variety of resources. So part of what I'll do right now is just walk you through a little bit of the background information that you might find within the NGSS documents itself and the um, framework uh, for K-12 science education. So we like to look at the, um, the uh, related content link on the NGSS uh, documents, if you look at those online. And you, when you do that, you'll notice that they provide for you some questions that might be answered by students as they investigate the topic. Um, for example, in, in this case, it would be how are plants, animals, and environments of the past similar or different from? current plants, animals, and environments. And the focus then would be also to have students construct explanations uh, using evidence uh, for how variations uh, actually provide advantage for surviving, finding mates, and reproducing. All of this information is directly from the resources in the Next Generation Science Standards document. In addition, there's a lot of support in the framework for K-12 science education. In the, in the um, core idea for uh, LS3 and the heredity, that information would be available on page 157. So as, as Ted said earlier, this is such a great um, resource that the, um, the, uh, it's important to go back to the framework for K-12 science education and really look at it and, and mine it for all the wealth of information for instruction and instructional design that it can provide you. Right, so there's two, uh, top, two uh, disciplinary core ideas um, that will be really the focus for today's webinar. Um, and these also are the parts of the elements of the NGSS. Um, First is that uh, the, the really important idea that many characteristics of organisms are inherited from their parents. So um, this is really goes back to uh, the idea of traits and um, how the traits will play out um, between uh, organisms and their parents, offspring and their parents. And then the second one is about um, different organisms and how they vary in their look and function uh, because of the inherited information. So these two core ideas really play together in thinking about the um, focus of this third grade. Um, we've also pulled a lot of information from the storylines um, and the uh, storyline for uh, 3.5 in this case and you can get that information right on the link that's there in the um, nextgenscience.org. And that gives, the storylines are great resources because they provide an overview of the um, individual uh, disciplinary core ideas. One of the key features of, um, okay, give me one second. One of the key features of the, um, the next of the framework K-12 science education is the pro progressions of, across the grade level. This is really important for thinking about, all right, so I'm going to sit, wait one second and I'm going to see if I can get a better sound. Hang on a second. All right, so is that better? I'll talk for a little bit, and you can see if that's any better or not. Can you um, try on. turning, Mary, can you try just turning your um, mic volume up just a little bit, maybe? That might help. Yep. All right, I got it up now as far as I can get it. So is that the any mic better? The one over the talk button, right? Ah, hang on. How's that? Is that better? Awesome. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Everybody. I'll keep going now. So this idea about the learning, the progression of disciplinary core ideas over time 
um, from first grade all the way through, or kindergarten, all the way through high school, is a really important conceptual shift for um, the next generation of science standards. So we've identified for you the, um, the changes in the sophistication of ideas over time from first grade, where these ideas about organisms are introduced, all the way through the high school. And, and this is just a small bit, especially at the high school and middle school, that you would see there. But it really reminds us that the foundational ideas in first grade and then third grade are critical for all of us um, to focus on and to do our part so that the students are ready for the more sophisticated learning that comes um, in the higher grades. All right. So this all, all of that, to, um, the progression might make you wonder, so where do you, where, what is your piece as a third grade teacher? And you can find that in the endpoints, which will come um, in, as part of the framework document. And I've actually just selected the endpoint for the end of um, the fifth grade here so that you could see what it is that's responsible for, what the, um, is responsible as far as the progression will go. Um, these endpoints are really important for understanding what the, the ultimate um, ideas are and um, where, where each grade level is responsible um, for getting. Then if we start moving a little bit uh, farther down, we're going to get the, to the performance expectation. Uh, Ted mentioned performance expectation. He showed you an example of a, of a different one um, from a different uh, set. And this is the performance expectation for the webinar tonight. So you'll notice that there are um, all the parts that Ted said earlier. Um, you, you can see that there's uh, the um, science and engineering practice up at the front of the performance expectation. So analyze and interpret data to provide evidence. And then there's the disciplinary core idea around plants and animals. And then finally, the uh, cross-cutting concept for this uh, performance expectation is uh, patterns. It's really critical to also uh, look at the clarification statements and the, um, and the uh, uh, assessment boundaries. Those red uh, sentences really give you some additional ideas, just like those endpoints about what's the responsibility? What are we supposed to be thinking about when we look at the, the performance expectation? And what's the right uh, information for third graders? So the clarification statement and the assessment boundaries will give you that kind of information. This is also um, the full uh, set of performance expectations for inheritance and variation of traits. And we're going to focus on this one that's circled. But you'll also see that there are these three others. And when you, when you go away from here later and you start to read through them, you'll really notice that there's a lot of connections among these um, three performance expectations or for performance expectations. And, and that's really a good place for us to think about as we're designing um, uh, instructional investigations for, for the third graders. Um, how do we pull together the pieces of each of these performance expectations and sh help students understand how they are linked together? So you might hear the word bundling. Um, and one way to really think about this in, as you're designing um, experiences for your students is how might you bundle these performance expectations together to really get um, this idea of coherence. So we're not attempting to provide um, individual activities for each one of these performance expectations. As Ted said earlier, these are really the outcome measures. Um, so the performance expectation tells us what students ought to be able to do at the end of instruction and what they would know at the end of instruction. Ted also provided an overview of the science and engineering practices earlier. What we've noticed in our work with teachers and what I would have done in my classroom is spend a good amount of time with planning and carrying out investigations. That's what we know we're supposed to be doing. So it makes us feel you know, really good to engage kids in that. And they're always all so excited about planning and carrying out investigations. But we also need to really consider the other performance expectations that push us a little more. So in um, this 
performance expectation that we're focused on today, analyzing and interpreting data is the connected scientific and engineering practice. But then there's others um, like developing explanations and engaging in arguments from evidence, which are also really part of the um, activities that you'll see Kimber um, engages her students with in, the cla in the, her classroom. All right, so we're going to um, take a second and um, really talk, uh, offer an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Um, and what we've noticed over time is that um, this is a great time for people to ask questions, but we've never actually had our special guests before. So um, we're going to ha allow Kimber to have some uh, an opportunity here to, to um, really answer some of these questions too. So if you have some questions for Kimber, um, read it either around the performance expectations or maybe preparing to teach the content of inheritance and various you're welcome to put those in the um, chat box. Mary, I'm actually wondering if we can um, have Kimber just address this question if, while people are typing other questions, which is how she goes about preparing to teach content that's unfamiliar with uh, to her because some of the content that you uh, shared or the ways that you move through the performance expectations can be a little overwhelming sometimes. And so um, I'm wondering if we can just start there and she can say a few things about that. Right. Well, first I read and reread and reread again the expectations just to try to get a sense of what they said. And I looked at things that Mary was pointing out, like what does this really mean in third grade, to see if I was on the right track by using insects to teach um, this content. And it seemed like that fit what was going on. So then I went on and looked at resources and books. I found um, an article in Science and Children that had an investigation that I thought would work as part of these expectations. I'm really lucky that I'm in a community that I can talk to um, science education professors and get their opinions and ideas too. So all of that helped me to work on the planning and trying to find ways to connect the content to the standards. All right, Mary, do you want to start sharing some of the other questions? Sure. Um, so have asked about uh, favorite resources. Um, so Kimber, when you are thinking about, um, you know, beyond the uh, connections to um, great faculty uh, and the NGSS and framework um, resources, have, have you used um, trade books or other kinds of NSTA resources? Um, yes, I definitely use trade books. I look for trade books that have content um, for students. I also, yes, go to my library and see what's available there. Um, I use the web. Um, there are lots of very interesting investigations that are online, and then I look at those and then find ways to tweak them to allow me to have the students be engaged in more of the scientific practices, like the uh, using evidence and uh, constructing explanations. Okay, so we're just looking at a little bit about the audio. It looks like Kimber's is okay, but Mary, we're having a little bit of trouble then. Um, in terms of sequencing, I think one of the things that we'll um, get to in the next part of the presentation in terms of preparing for teaching the lesson that you're going to see, how we use the idea of a coherent content storyline. Um, Mary, anything else before we move on? No, I think that's great. As we go on, though, um, I want to make sure that we attend to the question about um, PEs being, you know, what to teach or how to teach. Um, so maybe as we keep moving forward, we can double back around to that question when it's appropriate. Good. That's a great segue because um, as we move to this next part, the focus is on um, teaching um, to this particular performance expectation and what that involves. Um, but before we go too far down this path in the second section, we'd like to know um, from you, and we'd like you to use the polling tool to do this, which, um, how have you basically seen um, or experienced inheritance or variation being taught in elementary grades? These are just some examples that we've collected from our own experiences. If you select other, um, please write in the chat window. Um, Sue, can you remind people of how to use the polling tool? 
Sure. Um, underneath your name at the very top of the page, where under, underneath the word participant, your name there, the fourth box over, you should see a letter A. If you mouse over that and, and click on that A, that letter A, you will see a drop-down menu from which you will select A, B, C, or D. And please, if you are selecting B, please uh, give us an indication in the chat window um, what that other is. Go ahead and briefly describe it in the chat window for us. And then, Carla, as soon as you're ready for me to lock the polls, uh, just give a shout out and I will lock them and publish them for you. Great, Sue. Thank you. So let me go ahead and read through these. A is to create real or imagined organisms that show how particular adaptations are related to survival, for example, camouflage. B is collect data about how offspring look like or don't look like their parents and siblings. C, match pictures of animals and our plants to offspring, and D would be other, and that's where we are asking you to type in the chat window. If, um, if you can respond using the polling tool, um, we're going to see the results of that in just a second. So in the interest of time, Sue, why don't you close out the polling tool and let's see how people are responding. Okay. And they are published. Great. Okay. So it looks like a lot of people are responding. Um, the majority of people around uh, A and C, so the, that matching the pictures to offspring or creating real and imagined organisms, these are also very popular. Um, insects for variation of traits, uh, says Maureen in our chat window. That's awesome. You'll see some Madagascar hissing cockroaches tonight. Um, let's see. Trying to see if we have other ones in there. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on. I just want to remind you of our performance expectation tonight with the focus on the practices of analyzing and interpreting data and the core disciplinary idea of variation of these traits existing in a group of similar organisms. Typically, before we show a, a video clip of a lesson, we talk to you about what happened before um, that particular lesson and what happened after. But tonight, um, we would like to take a look at this idea of a coherent science content storyline um, as a way to organize instruction. This comes from the work of Kathy Roth and her colleagues who worked on the International Math Science Study, the video component of that, the most recent uh, Tim study. Um, it basically showed, uh, in a nutshell, that the United States and the United States were very good at activities um, in the science classroom, but we are not always connecting those activities with the science ideas. And so these are some of the, uh, the um, components of a content storyline that came out of that work, and some of these have been empirically shown to support students' um, learning, meaningful science learning. Um, the idea here is that you have a main learning goal, and that would be related to the performance expectation that we were talking about. Tend to focus on a question for this second point, and the idea that activities and content representations would match the learning goal. I know this seems really obvious, but the video study that uh, Kathy did really revealed that it wasn't happening as often as we would like to see it. This other idea of content ideas being linked to other content ideas and then sync with the sequencing activities appropriately so that it builds into a storyline um, that's related to the performance expectations, very important ideas here. And um, also important to note is that these, these aren't in a, a checklist kind of order. These components of a content storyline work together. So let's show you how this played out in the particular um, lessons that you're going to see. Um, Kimber in third grade here in State College, Pennsylvania, does an adaptations unit. It's the first unit of the school year. So when you see the video, that was recorded in September with a brand new crew of third grade students. Um, basically, what we like to do is organize around this notion of a question and a claim what kind of evidence the students would need to, to construct that claim, the reasoning and the science ideas that they might be using, and the investigation that would best be used to provide the kind of evidence to get to the claim. And again, and whenever you have the opportunity to interact with actual phenomena, um, the better that is. So hence the hissing cockroaches instead of photographs. 
Um, right here um, is that same line. So the, the lesson that you're going to see comes out of this cockroaches, the highlighted line about whether cockroaches have these individual differences. And so this shows what comes in the storyline before that lesson. Kids need to know what insects are. Are hissing cockroaches insects? What kinds of special adaptations? Well, first of all, what are adaptations? And which ones do insects have? Uh, I'm sorry, cockroaches have. All of those things are important, and they involve looking at commonalities. The highlighted lesson here is one where they're really looking at variation. And then, of course, this is only a piece of the storyline. Again, the highlighted piece is what you're going to see in the lesson. Uh, the video clip that's been edited down from the lessons, and then we go on to look at variations and how they help an individual, individuals rather, to survive, and how the environment influences the survival of organisms. So these are all things that came afterwards. We would imagine that after all of this, and, and I would say that one line does not equal one lesson. In fact, the lesson that you're going to see was edited down from probably parts of three different lessons. Um, by the end of this, you would be getting to the performance expectation. So that's the assessment boundary. So teaching, um, the teaching video, we always like to let you know a little bit about the, the context. We're in central rural Pennsylvania. Um, we are geographically isolated. We have um, all around us in about three hours, you can get to a lovely large urban centers, but um, drive outside of State College. 10 minutes in any direction, and you are either in a state park or um, a dairy farm. Uh, the lessons that you're uh, going to see, I mentioned, are from the first science unit of the year. There are 22 students in the class. Two of those students have IEPs, and three are ESL students. Um, the teacher is Kimber, so I don't need to tell you the uh, extensive knowledge and experience that she has. You, you probably know that, especially if you're familiar with the book. And the video, as I mentioned, is, meta is edited down, this particular five and a half minute video edited down from at least three 50 minute sessions. So um, as always, we ask you to respect your colleagues who share their classrooms with us in order for us to learn. Um, these, I, I refer to teachers who let us come in and barge in in some ways and video record in their classrooms. It's not really that disruptive, I hope. But um, they're really superheroes um, for allowing. It takes tremendous courage and bravery um, to open up like that and be vulnerable to your peers in the name of learning. So it shows a great deal of commitment um, to the profession to do this. And as, as we get started down this path, um, we really like um, for Kathy to chime in now and get you focused on some things that she'd like you to pay attention to when you see the video in just a moment. So the next two slides are going to look very familiar to those of you who have been here since the beginning. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about this, this first slide. And this is called Taught Moves, and it's from Ready, Set, Science. Um, it's from Chapter 5 called Making Thinking Visible, Talk and Argument. This is my favorite chapter. I highly recommend this chapter, if not the book. It's an easy read, and when I was in the classroom, this book really helped me change my teaching. Um, I'm moving on to the next slide, which again should be very familiar to you, but it's on page 70 of the book, What's Your Evidence, that both Carla and Kimber were um, part of the writing. Um, and it's another ex excellent example of a chart that teachers can use to encourage students' discourse um, when they're grappling with phenomena. So I didn't spend much time on the first one in the interest of time. but. Some of the talk moves that I just want you to think about as you watch the video are, you know, refocusing on guiding questions. Hmm, do you see that? Analyzing data, what do you think? Listen carefully for some of these. Wait time, do you notice that? Um, I think that you will, and with that, I want to move right on to the video, I believe, is where we are. Thanks, Kathy. That's right. And so we are going to need a little help from our moderator, Sue, right now to launch the video. We ask that as you're watching this, you're thinking about the talk moves and how Kimber uses those to support um, the experience of students analyzing data and constructing claims from evidence. Sue? 
Yes. Um, I have gone ahead and changed the poll so you, everyone should see a green check mark up underneath your name. I'm going to remind you when you are done watching the video, that when you get back into the room with us, to please give us a green check so that we know that you're with us. Um, I am going to push this video out. It's going to open up in a separate browser. I will also post uh, a link to the video in the chat box. And a reminder to those of you that are not on a hardwired system, you may have a difficult time viewing this. I do encourage you to stick around um, and bookmark the link for later. So here we go. Kathy, can you turn your mic off, please? Hi. Um, so, so at this point, we want to ask you how did Kimber use TalkMoves to scaffold the experience of analyzing qualitative data and constructing a claim for evidence? Um, could we get you to type some of your noticings in the chat, as well as any questions you have at this point? So please go ahead and type your responses um, in the chat window, or your ideas, the things that you were noticing from uh, Kimber's video, um, anything related to the talk moves or other things I noticed that people were referring to the notebooks as well. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that.
So I'm seeing um, some really nice comments um, about the use of evidence, weaving in science vocabulary, redirecting students to the guiding question. Um, really nice. And so we saw, we saw some of these things as well. Um, so some of the highlights from the video, and especially if you weren't at, able to access the video, we hope you're keeping the link and that you're able to go back and see those. We'll keep those on file, so you should be able to ask, ask access those at any time in the future. But in particular, Kimber is really great with getting kids to engage with the phenomena across this uh, particular unit by interacting and observing and manipulating, um, in this case, the, the hissing cockroaches. And she created opportunities for students to identify patterns and collect and record data. In this case, data or qualitative data about observations. And she also used talk moves that are intended to get at students' ideas and, and scaffold this constructing a claim from evidence. And so because the talk moves are so important, um, those intentional questions um, and uh, rephrasing that teachers do to move the conversation forward towards attaining the, the performance expectation, we're going to have Kathy ask Kimber a couple of specific questions uh, about her use of talk moves. Hi. So, Kimber, one of the things I really noticed. And Kathy, you're really quiet. Can I, I don't know if anything changed with your mic. Um, okay. That's Try that. How's the? Okay. So, Kimber, one of the things I really noticed um, was the re um, the revoicing and helping by you revoicing. Can you tell us why you use that? particular talk move, what that does to help move students forward as they grapple with the phenomena? It, I feel like it helps students to, it helps the class then to zero in on, on what that student was saying and kind of validate that process. And, and I try to do that particularly in ways that are going to um, make the talk go forward toward being able to make a claim and, or, or focusing students on the evidence that, that we were collecting. That was important. Um, the other thing that you do really well is that refocusing on the question. I mean, we heard, I heard it multiple times, um, and it seems to really work. Can, can you tell us how you got started doing that and what helped you know how to begin to do that? Well, <laughs> it's a process, but uh, to me, looking at something like using um, a clues chart or a, or a content storyline that asks you to think about what your question is and then what do you want your students to be able to uh, do to get an answer for that question and collect evidence, help then help me to understand how important it is to continue to come back to those guiding questions for the students and refer those. I always try to post those. Um, um, the students always write the guiding questions in their notebooks, and then they know to refer back to that. And this was the beginning of the year. At this point in the year, my students would know that it, how important it was for them to be able to answer that question and, and base it on evidence. They would talk a lot about that. Well, one more question, and then we'll move on. So we're talking about questions, and we use a lot of questions. I didn't hear you telling your students anything. Can you tell us a little bit about the importance and why you don't tell them and just give them information, but try to get that information from them? I do feel that's really important, Kathy. I feel it's important that the students are the ones that are able to come to the understanding and that we co-construct the ideas together. When students do that, their engagement and their understanding, in my experience, really deepens, and also their ownership in the content. I saw some questions. Um, people were asking about vocabulary, and I I do not introduce that vocabulary at the beginning. I introduce it as it comes up in the conversation, as it comes up in our claims. And then my students have um, a glossary in the back of their notebook 
we, we work together to do the definitions. We look them up. We look at several sources, and then the students help me format what those, how, what those definitions are going to be. So that, again, it's not just me giving them those definitions, but the definitions come out of the class discussion and out of the investigation. I think that's important for the students to have ownership. All throughout this unit, my students kept telling me and reminding me that we hadn't written a definition for adaptations, and they kept wanting to add that, just to show you their ownership in it. That's great. Thank, thank you so much, Kimber, for sharing your thoughts. Everybody appreciates it. So, Kathy, were you going to say anything about scaffolding data collection? Sorry, I actually forgot for a second. Um, so, Kimber, the, I loved um, watching you work with the students around some of the data. Um, can you explain a little bit about how this all works in the classroom on a regular basis? Well, collecting the data is an important part of the investigation, um, the, and these particular investigations really lent themselves, I felt, to doing charts. The investigation that was on the video, the students spent the day before really observing a particular cockroach and making all the observations they could about it. And then we mixed up the cockroaches, and they had to look at each one and decide whether it fit the data for their cockroach. I was really using it also to help them understand the use of evidence. And it worked very well to, for them to understand the individual differences, as well as what is evidence and how do you use evidence. Um, then in the slide that, that you're seeing now, um, these had to do with hiding different colors of um, toothpicks to be grasshoppers, and we used it to determine camouflage and how their coloration helped them to survive in a particular environment. Um, the, the students really respond to seeing. They have their own individual data charts in their notebooks, and then we also do a cl an overall class one that we can use for discussion. I think that's very important. So, thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> oh, yeah, Kathy. I just wanted to say I've been in Kimber's classroom when she's doing this kind of work, and a lot of thought goes into how that data table or how the observations are recorded so that students can actually see the kind of pattern that will, that will so serve as evidence to support um, claims that respond to the driving question. So it really is important to kind of think that through. And if you go back to that earlier slide on a coherent science content storyline and the storylines we plan, we spend a lot of time thinking which investigation and then what kind of data comes out of it, and then how does that data work for us in responding to the claim. Another thing that Kimber does really, really well is constructing claims from evidence. I think you saw the beginning of that. Not only was she working on this particular um, content and these scientific practices, but she was also very much introducing the notion of constructing a claim from evidence with students. This was the first time they really thought about it. So this slide is actually from the lesson the next day where she comes back and summarizes the claim and the evidence that students had generated. And they talk about which one is claim, which one is evidence, why, um, what's in there. Um, we find often that, um, that even though the scientific practice that was identified in the PE um, might be uh, about planning and carrying out investigations, or in this case, analyzing and interpreting data, the ultimate goal is to be able to use the evidence to develop explanations and to engage in argument from evidence. Um, from the um, NGSS and the framework, I think it's probably important to just say a couple of things about how they differentiate constructing um, explanations and, and argumentation. Um, the idea of constructing an explanation is actually using the data, using observations um, and science ideas to construct evidence-based accounts of natural phenomena, the how and why the phenomena occurs. So it might be several claim evidence sequences that get you to this. Arguing from evidence is that process of negotiation as kids really work back and forth about what the evidence means and what the claim actually is, that's where the argumentation comes in. 
So we have used and have found that the claim evidence reasoning um, framework is one that is really useful to structure this process, and that's where Kimber is, I mean, this is highlighted in the book that she co-authored, co and this is really leading towards what she does with her students all the time, but was just introducing in the video that you saw. This representation of the CER framework, Claims Evidence Reasoning Framework, is one that I really like. It comes from the work of our colleagues Kate McNeil and Joe Krejcik. I like it because it highlights um, that it's from the evidence. So you're engaged with the phenomena, you're investigating a particular question about the phenomena, but the claim actually comes out of looking for patterns across evidence, which really requires analyzing and interpreting evidence. So with that, we're going to bring it back home um, with Mary Starr. Awesome. Well, we have been we've gone a long way, and now we're coming back, and it's, we're winding up and, and moving towards the end. Um, what we really Mary, uh, Mary, your volume yeah. is real soft again. If you could turn up your mic for us. All right. Well, I got it. All right. Is that any better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, what we've been focusing on is moving past those activities, right? Really getting into having to engage with scientific phenomena to construct arguments and explanations. Kimber showed us a great example, and the storyline that was in that table um, that uh, Carla showed us earlier is really critical to thinking about planning to go beyond those activities. So I um, have been working with some people in Maryland, and they gave me this great analogy. Um, it's like a box of chocolates. So what we've been doing is I'm focusing on activities and hands-on activities that kids love and we all love and everybody's having a good time. And it's like a box of chocolates. It makes us feel good. Um, and it's, you know, sort of um, tasty. But it's not exactly um, the storyline idea, because right now I could pick any chocolate I wanted. I could think about, um, you know, whether I want a nougat today or a nut um, tomorrow. And there's not really any way that I can organize or scaffold the students' learning, even though they would be really busy doing the kinds of hands-on activities we've been focused on. So what we need to do is move more towards this I do have a really nice, well-balanced meal where we're picking the um, ingredients carefully, thinking about how they're going to go into the meals, and then scaffolding or you know using the meals in um, particular ways. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, in, in sort of the same way as that storyline uh, gave us the idea earlier um, in the in the webinar. So what do you have to do to get to this place? Well, you know, you need to know all these things. Um, display of idea is all about the performance expectations, the learning progressions. Um, and there were some, some comments earlier in the chat window about how are we going to do all this? Well, we know that it's a lot. This is not something that we're going to be able to do in the short term. It's really, a, this is an opportunity for us as science teachers to, to stop to assess our instruction, to think about the investigations and the questions that we're having kids engage with, the science phenomenon, to work together to, to investigate those performance expectations, and really consider what are the experiences we're having kids engage in. Um, and, and we can do that in really small ways. We don't have to you know, throw out everything. We can start with just thinking about the, the science and engineering practices. Um, and how that that one thing, if we were to inc include it into the instruction, would start to really change um, what we're doing in classrooms and how students are learning. So um, I guess one, one uh, statement I would say is we need to be kind to ourselves. We need to really give ourselves some time to do this learning so that we can um, focus on students' learning and the types of investigations and um, science talk that will really move them to toward uh, those performance expectations as part of the assessment. So um, now I'm going to turn that back over to Kathy so she can give you a little bit of an overview of the webinars and then some more resources. So 
it's really important to us that we really think about um, the purpose of, of why we're doing this. And here again, I just want to restate, and Mary really pretty much said it really well, but the importance of engaging young children in meaningful science learning and science discourse. Those are the science and engineering practices. If we're doing that, we really have a great start. Elementary science, K-5 to science, is the foundation for all future learning in science. We all have to do our part. The NGSS is giving us a chance to really focus on instruction. Let's take a good close look and see what we are doing and whether it works. I know that if I was in the classroom today, the things I would be teaching the way I would be teaching science would be much different than it was seven years ago. It's so important to connect with ELA and mathematics. Science is our way in. For, for a long time now, science has been shut out because of such a, a specific focus on ELA and math. Well, the NGSS were purposely written and constructed with intentional connections to those those common core standards. Once we're doing talk, when we're thinking about vocabulary, when we're looking at trade books, that is literacy. The other thing that's been mentioned over and over tonight that is so important is that development of a community of practice that's focused on the elementary grades. I can't tell you how important collaboration is and will continue to be as we move forward with NGSS. Um, and we want to have a vehicle to access instructional resources for teaching. And one of those vehicles has been talked about already, um, but it's the NSTA Learning Center. Um, and there are many more that I'll talk about in a few minutes. But right now, I'm going to turn it back and let you think about this question. What is one idea or practice from tonight that you think you're going to take back to your instructional setting and use. All of the information you share with us is so important to us as we plan the future webinars. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to type in the chat. So these are great. Intentional talk moves, um, having kids collect and make sense of data, using CER, um, ready, set, science as a resource, the claims and evidence focus, looking for patterns. And I think the key here is to not use the activity as the endpoint, but as the place where you collect evidence that you leverage then um, to engage in constructing explanations from evidence. So really glad that that makes sense to people. Um, lots of great resources out there for talk moves and for notebooks um, and data collection. So thank you. This really looks great um, in terms of the kinds of things that resonated with people. And if you get a chance to go back, if you missed part of it, or if you want to focus on particular pieces, if you get a chance to go back, um, the, there are a number of resources that you shared with one another just in the chat window. All right, Kathy, take us home. So I'm not going to spend too much time here on the Learning Center because Sue did a, an awesome job in the beginning, but I do want to say that there are so many resources here. You need to spend some time here. Um, there is a collection that goes with tonight's web seminar that if I do say so myself, is really worth spending some time in and checking out. And now I'm going to move on to the other one. So here are some of the specific pieces that were talked about um, in some one way or another tonight. So science shorts, that's from a Science and Children article. Kimber referenced it. Um, Ready, set, science. What's your evidence? I also have here 
put here on this slide three of the books that Kimber used as part of her instruction. And this last one over here is called Checklist Goals for um, Talk Moves. And it comes from the Inquiry Project and Talk Science. And that's another website with lots of resources, including short videos um, and short videos um, and lots of other tools that you can use in your instruction. So I really hope you go to the Learning Center, you access these. I want us, I want you to ask us questions. I want you to follow us on Twitter. Um, we're really looking forward to keeping up contact with you. And I'm done. All right, so um, take a second here and just really thank our speakers. I want to talk about some of the resources that we've uh, got here in place. Um, we've got the next, next gen, oops, hang on. Ah, yes, great. Jeff just did something for me quickly behind the scenes. We've had some talk and discussion about the, you know, getting ready for these um, resources, how do we as teachers develop. And so I remembered from a previous set of slides, um, a presentation Peter McLaren did, uh, something that I think is a good piece for everyone to keep in mind here, is that you're not going to change overnight in this, set, in this piece here. And even the states that have adopted NGSS there are years before they're expecting teachers to be fully implementing this. So, you know, work baby steps, work to get things through here and deal with it. And yes, please share this web seminar with everyone, everyone you know. You know, it makes a great Christmas gift. Um, but to go on a second, we've got a bunch of different resources in place here. Um, we've got listservs uh, for NSTA members. We have discussion forums in the Learning Center. This conversation is, go, is going to continue. We hope we can see you at future web seminars in place here. Um, we've got our next web seminar, January 24th, 1st. That's fourth grade. I would encourage you to be here. I would encourage your fourth grade colleagues to join us into it. And that is coming along down the line. We've got archived a something in the number of 30 to 40 different web seminars, all, all of which are available for you to look at. One's on the practices, on the cross-cutting concepts. We've got the disciplinary core ideas, the things, the topics of assessment. Wide variety of journal articles on different pieces in all of our journals. Obviously, Science and Children is one you may be most familiar with. Even if you're not an NST member, a number of these journal articles are freely available. We have books at this point coming out of our ears. We've got the framework the standards, our reader's guide to the framework, our reader's guide to the standard, translating NGSS into classroom instruction, a guide for introducing teachers and administrators to NGSS, and then a little shout out for a book I've done some work on about a quick reference guide to the standards, which slices the di and dices the standards in a bunch of different folks, different places. Um, there's an app for that. Um, just like any place else, you can find standards on an NGSS app. We've got our conference coming up in Chicago. And I want to make sure you're aware, Saturday morning at our Chicago conference, we're going to have a piece called the NGSS and NSTA share where you can meet living and breathing, not just disembodied voices. Our wonderful team that's been doing these web seminars, Carla, and Kathy and Mary, and a chance to talk to them and other folks. There's a lot of other pieces on NGSS. All day Friday, there's a full series of talks that's coming. Oh, great, Kimber's going to be there too, I've just been informed. And so, great place to come. I hope we'll see you all there. We've got a STEM forum as well coming up in Minneapolis. Another place to be. And down the road, area conferences next fall to sort of just ha keep in mind and having your calendar. Hopefully, we're coming to somewhere near you soon. Um, so that's the big pieces there for tonight about resources. We really want to continue this conversation and NSTA wants to support you as you develop your own understanding. With that, I'm going to pass things off to Sue who can go through and um, uh, show you how to do your 
um, your survey, your evaluation, and then we're going to be back for some questions from our elite group of uh, presenters. Thank you, Ted. I'm actually going to go back. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> I think we're competing here. Um, I want to go back. Um, I did post the link for the frameworks. Um, I have both links there for um, the NAP.edu and the NSTA um, store. So both links are there for the framework for K-12 science education. Um, and with that, let's please uh, give a huge round of applause. And again, we give applause by mousing over our smiley face that's underneath our name at the very top. And clicking applause, as you can see, we're applauding. Uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kimber. And thank you, Jeff. An absolutely amazing uh, presentation. You guys did an excellent job. I'm a middle school teacher, teacher and um, I learned lots. This was great. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for sponsoring today's program. And thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support of web seminars. I want to remind you that you can find resources related to today's presentation by going to the web seminar collection in the NSTA Learning Center, which will include the archives of this web seminar and the presentation slides. The collection may also include journal articles and lesson plans, interactive content modules called Science Objects and SciPacks, and links to helpful websites and multimedia. I'm going to put a drink, uh, link directly into the chat box for this collection. Give me just a second to scroll back up to it. Oh, no. Yep, I am going to scroll back up. And I will post that in. And I encourage you to go ahead and bookmark that. So I don't want you to go anywhere yet. You need to stay here. <laughs> go ahead and bookmark that for checking out later. Um, I also want to remind you that you will receive an email within the next day or so. And that email will also have a link to the archive of this web seminar and to the collection. And here's a look at what's coming up on, web seminar, on the web seminar calendar. On January 6th, we have How to Avoid Disqualification on Explorer Vision. And January 15th, Creating and Sharing Collections in the NSTA Learning Center. And January 21st, we're coming back with NGSS with Teaching NGSS in Elementary School, fourth grade. Um, I want to encourage you to register for these upcoming programs by visiting learningcenter.nsta.org forward slash web seminars. And I'm actually going to post that link into the chat box for you to make it easy for you to get registered because web seminars are just that awesome. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone this evening for your participation. We look forward to seeing you again on another NSTA Web Seminar soon.